You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the Heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for March 17th, 2023. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. Today, we'll do a second ACC Part 2 review. This includes HEFPEF, oral PCSK9 inhibition, pulmonary artery hypertension, medical adherence, soft thinking, and the question of metabolically healthy obese individuals. But before I start, I want to remind all the listeners that It's not just me doing this podcast. There's a team of people at the heart.org Medscape Cardiology that help me, and I really want to recognize them for their editorial and technical support. Okay, so first topic is HEFPEF, and we're going to have to talk about it again. JAMA has published the Rapid HF trial, first author Yogesh Reddy from the Mayo Clinic, now, this was an elegant crossover study involving rate-adaptive pacing during exercise. It was presented at ACC, and it seemingly challenged my excitement about a breakthrough pacing study from a month or so ago. Now, of that last sentence, let's focus on the modifier seemingly for challenge. Okay, first, last month's my pace study, then this new rapid HF study. I don't really think these studies counter each other at all. Instead, I think they complement each other. Let me just say a few words about MyPace, which was the older study that I talked about. MyPace, which was published last month in JAMA Cardiology, first author Maggie Infeld, this studied patients with HEFPEF who already had pacemakers. Now, these were special pacemakers and special patients. I say special in that pacing rates in these patients could be increased with preservation of normal PR intervals and without causing RV apical pacing. And that's because they used three different kinds of pacemakers in this study. Those with conduction system pacing leads that pace the conduction system and they cause uh, ventricular activation simultaneously and there's no RV dyssynchrony. They also had cardiac resynchronization therapies or so-called BIV pacers which also can preserve the PR interval and prevent RV dyssynchrony. And they had a smaller number of standard dual-chamber pacers that achieved a little higher pacing rate with atrial pacing only. Now, the MyPace study did not, did not focus on exercise pacing rate. Instead, they randomized patients with HEFPEF to a personalized accelerated pacing program or usual care and the average heart rates in the active pacing arm was about 75 beats per minute, and it was 65 in the usual care group. The MyPace authors showed that quality of life, BNP, patient activity, and AFib rates were all better with a slightly higher pacing rate. They did not focus on exercise heart rates at all, and these patients had enough bradycardia to already have pacemakers. So my pace investigators invoked the idea that lower heart rates in patients with HEFF could be detrimental because of the longer fill a time, filling times get patients on the steep part of that volume pressure curve of end diastolic pressure. Crucially, crucially, due to the special pacemakers in the study, the authors could increase pacing rates and know that the PR interval could be preserved as well as synchronous biventricular contraction. Now, they also cited an an important study by Palo et al. These are Spanish authors who had published in JAK earlier in the year, and they found that beta blocker withdrawal in patients with HEFPEF, which obviously resulted in slightly higher heart rates as well, improved functional capacity. 
and when I discussed my pace, I was careful to say that implanting pacers willy-nilly in patients with HEFPEF is not one of the conclusions we should take from that study. Instead, the notion that lower heart rates in patients with stiff ventricles is a dogma that may need to be overturned. Okay, now to this newer rapid HF trial that was presented at ACC. At Mayo Clinic, Reddy and colleagues recruited patients with HEFPEF who met the criteria for chronotropic incompetence. They defined chronotropic incompetence, but I will tell you from my experience, this chronotropic incompetence business is not easy to sort out in real life. Basically, it is as it sounds. Chronotropic incompetence is the inability to raise one's heart rate to what it should be during exercise. And the problem here is that heart rate increases are extremely highly variable. And it's also really hard to know what heart rate should be. The study included 32 patients who had pacers implanted. Now, that seems like a small study, but not really, because they did a crossover study wherein one group of the patients who got pacers had AAIR, rate-adaptive atrial pacing, set to increase heart rate during exercise, versus a period of time of patients who had no pacing, and then after a month washout period, patients crossed over to the no pacing versus rate adaptive pacing. The primary endpoint of rapid HF was oxygen consumption at anaerobic threshold. Basically, functional capacity. The first thing to say that this is a really nice design, and the authors first showed that in the pacing off group, the heart rate during exercise did correlate with performance. That is, higher heart rate achieved seemed to correlate somewhat weakly with performance. They then show that compared to no pacing, patients randomized to the rate adaptive pacing had slightly higher rates during submaximal and during peak exercise. The difference was about 14 to 16 beats per minute in the rapid pacing arm versus the uh, control arm with no pacing. And the main results, not a shred of difference in functional capacity, also no difference in BNP or KCCQ quality of life. They did some exploratory analysis to look at why this was, reported that there was no increase in cardiac output, despite these higher rates, likely because of a reduction in stroke volume. Remember, cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate. So heart rate can go up, but if stroke volume goes down, it's a wash. And of course, six patients had adverse events from the pacemaker, including pericardial effusion, a lead-induced tricuspid regurge, and some skin reactions. So they concluded that in patients with HEFPEF and chronotropic incompetence, implantation of a pacemaker to enhance exercise heart rate did not result in an improvement in exercise capacity and was associated with increased adverse events from the pacemaker. Now, the editorialist took an even more negative view of pacing in HEFPEF. And you should read their editorial. First author, Adalain Kitzman. Now, they make five points in the editorial. First, exercise limitations in HEFPEF are complicated and have as much to do with peripheral oxygen uptake as cardiac dysfunction. The second point is that HEFPEF is a quintessential systemic multi-organ disorder, which neatly explains why cardiac drugs have failed. Now, the authors do note that SGLT2 inhibitors are an exception to drugs that fail, but I would take issue with that because you know how I feel about this. SGLT2 drugs only reduce one small fraction of hospitalization, so I see them as marginally beneficial, if at all. Third point the editorialists make, they find that the lack of benefit of rapid HF is credible and they lump it in with other pacing trials that have been negative as well. And editorialists were swayed by the reduction of stroke volume with higher paced rates. Finally, they say since exercise performance depends so much on peripheral oxygen uptake at the skeletal muscle, they favor exercise programs as a way to help these patients. All right, let me tell you how I put these together, my synthesis. Now, I think these studies are apples and oranges. The patients were entirely different. The intervention was different. The interpretations are different and, I think, complementary. First, the patients in rapid HF had resting heart rates of 76 beats per minute at rest. They were not bradycardic. Their pacers were put in solely for chronotropic incompetence or inadequate heart rate during exercise, 
which I believe is a very difficult diagnosis to make. Patients in my pace already had pacemakers. They had symptomatic bradycardia, and the control arm had heart rates of 65, close to the lower rate of the pacer. Okay, second point. Rapid HF studied only the effects on exercise. My pace studied the effects of a personalized pacing program that supported slightly higher rates all the time. Third point, Rapid HF used AAIR pacing. While they report 0% ventricular pacing, we don't know about PR intervals during exercise. PR intervals are an underappreciated component of cardiac function. And AAIR pacing at higher rates, especially in the presence of beta blocker, which patients were on, many of them, uh, could have prolonged the PR interval, and that could have affected stroke volume. Now, my excitement about the heart rate revelations in HEFPEF remain. A, we should not implant pacemakers for chronotropic incompetence in HEFPEF. I can just tell you from my cycling experience, I find it totally unsurprising that giving patients 14 to 16 beats per minute more made no difference. Exercise performance as outlined nicely in the editorial is way more complex than a few more heartbeats uh, per minute during exercise. B, the MyPace conclusions that avoiding extremely low heart rates continues to be a really fruitful strategy, I think. C, the corollary to that is beta blocker withdrawal should be favored, and D, if pacing is used, it needs to be under the direction of an electrophysiologist who is facile in modern pacing techniques. This willy-nilly increasing of pacing rates with a standard pacer I think is going to be foolish. Once again, electrophysiology is going to prove its value in the management of patients with heart failure. Now, of course, of course, we need more data on heart rate strategies, be they beta blocker removal or pacing, and, we, and the mindset of HEFPEF as more than a cardiac disease is also highly relevant. I like that about the editorial. It explains the failure of why many cardiac drugs have failed. And I also remain enthusiastic about exercise as a potential therapy. The editorialist comments about, uh, quote, a single bout of exercise in sedentary individuals evokes a nearly immediately large increase in skeletal muscle gene transcription has this enticing plausibility, and while early studies of exercise and HEFPEF have shown promise, we need more data uh, in the pragmatic setting with exercise. The HEFPEF space is getting more and more exciting, not so much because of new drugs, but because of these new revelations. Okay, next topic is oral PCSK9 inhibitors. Last week, I discussed a clear outcomes trial, a trial of the non-statin cholesterol-lowering drug benpidoic acid. Well, ACC has featured another non-statin cholesterol-lowering agent, but it's so early in the development process that Merck has not yet given it a name. It is now called MK0616, and it is an oral PCSK9 inhibitor. Jack has published this phase 2 dose-ranging RCT that was presented. As you know, proprotein, convertase, subtelesin, cachexin, type 9 inhibitors, PCSK9 inhibitors, are already approved for LDL cholesterol lowering in high-risk patients. But these drugs require a shot, and nobody likes a shot. I certainly don't like shots. People are far more accustomed to taking pills or tablets. So there's this race to develop oral PCSK9 drugs at Merck is early with this orally bioavailable renally excreted macrocyclic peptide that can bind PCSK9 with monoclonal antibody-like affinity at 1 one-hundredth of the molecular weight. Nearly 400 patients were randomized to one of either four doses of the oral drug or placebo. The primary endpoints of this phase two study were percent change in LDL cholesterol at week 8 and the proportion with adverse effects. Uh, dr the drug resulted in statistically significant and large reductions in LDL cholesterol, and there was a graded response and no signal of adverse effects. So my comments are easy, very short. Phase 2 studies are mostly for finding dosages to use in phase 3 studies wherein the drug is assessed for reducing cardiovascular outcomes. This is promising. The LDL reductions are substantial. 
but it has to show reduction in clinical outcomes, and my prediction is it likely will. Other companies are also developing oral PCSK9 inhibitors, so it's going to be a race. Merck obviously is off to a good start. The next topic today is pulmonary arterial hypertension. Now, I don't treat many patients with PAH. Maybe you do, but even if you don't, ACC brought pretty amazing news about a new drug called Sodatercept. Sodatercept, I think I'm saying it right. I cover this story because it's a potentially major breakthrough in an uncommon but tragic disease. A, a drug developer that I'm on a private group with called it a game changer, and he's not involved with the company that makes this drug. I want to say kudos to journalist Mitchell Zoller, who has a wonderful explanatory news column on the heart.org, and you should take a look at that if you want to understand more about this. Uh, first, a few words about PAH. This is a disease that involves proliferative remodeling of the small pulmonary arteries that leads to then progressive narrowing of these arteries, and then, of course, results in right heart failure. Now, why? Why does this happen? Well, I don't think anybody really knows. Uh, from my reading, there's an altered signal transduction of the growth factors. Uh, these mechanisms are way above my pay scale. So the Teresap is an engineered molecule that combines a section of the human IgG molecule with a portion of the receptor for activin. Activin. This structure allows soda Teresap to bind free activin molecules in a patient's blood, thereby removing a key driver of the pulmonary vascular wall remodeling that is at the pathologic root of PAH. The New England Journal of Medicine published results of the Stellar trial which is an RCT of 163 patients with PAH. The primary endpoint was a change in six-minute walk test, and it was highly positive for sodotericept. The first eight secondary endpoints were significantly improved with the drug as well compared with placebo. Adverse events did occur more frequently with the drug than with placebo, and these included epistaxis, dizziness, telangiectasias, increased hemoglobin levels, thrombocytopenia, and slightly increased blood pressure. Now, FDA has rendered sodotericept a breakthrough therapy designation and orphan drug designation. The editorialists were excited, but they also noted uh, several cautions and concerns. They questioned the generalizability of the findings, and they noted that the patients with PAH who were enrolled in this study were all adults who were clinically stable on an average of more than eight years out from their initial PAH diagnosis, and more than 90% of these patients were on stable treatment for PAH with two or three agents specifically for treating that disorder. The study cohort also had a disproportionately high enrollment of patients with idiopathic or heritable forms of PAH, and the 15% of patients in the trial with connective tissue disease represented a disproportionately low prevalence of the PAA subtype. So again, getting into the external validity of trials. I mentioned this story in much the same vein as the oral PCSK9 inhibitor study. It's early, yes, and surely the soda tercept drug will be incredibly costly, but for the 3 and 4 in 100,000 patients with this terrible condition, PAH, there may be a disease-modifying option, emphasis on maybe. Now, I am told by people in the know in the drug, drug development space that soda tercept is the first way that there will be more therapies targeting the same pathway. Of course, the other reason to mention this in the oral PCSK9 inhibitor study is to reemphasize that you can take a medically conservative approach to new therapies and still be in awe of biology, as well as the incentives inherent in a profit-driven development system. I am not sure breakthrough drugs like this get developed without incentives. So there, I am not a nihilist. All right, next topic is a really, really important trial called ACCESS trial. This has to do with free medicines and cardiovascular outcomes. A research team in the province of Alberta, Canada, Calgary and Edmonton, published a very important paper about medical adherence to cardiovascular medicines. It's important because it reminds us to avoid soft thinking. Now, soft thinking is such a problem in medicine today. We underestimate complexity far too often. 
consider, for example, the idea of not thinking about the negative externalities of the punitive hospital readmissions reduction program. That's a shining example of soft thinking. These Canadian researchers tested the idea that eliminating co-payments for high-value medications among low-income older adults who were at high cardiovascular risk would improve their clinical outcomes. Let's go slow here. Oh, discussions about disparities and outcomes among low and high socioeconomic patients is a very frequent conversation that's had. High costs are seen as causal, right? Low-income adults would be most at risk for poor outcomes because they're not taking their statins or other preventive medicines. Heck, higher use of preventive medicines was held up as causal in the 40% reduction in cardiovascular deaths and MI in the Scott Heart trial, wherein patients had uh, and the CTA arm had higher use of these meds. So, gosh, if it's going to cause a 40% reduction in Scott Heart, these medicines must be amazing, and we must get patients on them. So the ACCESS trial was actually a two-by-two two factorial trial testing both the waiving of copayments of high-value meds and a self-management education and support program. But this paper, the one presented at ACC and published in circulation, considered only the free medicines part. Their primary outcome is notable. It was not use of medicines. It was actual outcomes. A composite of death, MI, stroke, coronary vascularization, and cardiovascular-related hospitalization over three years. And I want to emphasize how important and notable that choice was. Many similar implementation science papers measure medicine adherence as an outcome. That, in my opinion, is a weak surrogate. If you think your policy or nudge is going to help patients have the gumption to measure outcomes. Good on the researchers. Access enrolled nearly 5,000 patients, followed them for three years. The rate of the primary outcome was not, was not reduced in the group that had no copayments. 521 versus 533 events, not statistically significant. None of the components of the primary endpoint had statistically significant differences, nor did changes in quality of life or health care cost. In statin adherence, hardly budged. It was like 0.72 versus 0.68, and there was no difference in ACE-ARB adherence. The author's conclusions, quote, in low-income adults at high cardiovascular risk, Eliminating copayments, averages of $35 a month, did not improve clinical outcomes or reduced health care costs, despite a very modest improvement in adherence to medications. Okay, my comments. These are remarkable findings that align well with ideas I've expressed often on this podcast. First, let's talk about the patients. These were older patients. Mean incomes were low. No one was over $50,000 per year, which is about $38,000 in U.S. dollars. Most were even lower income. So I would say that even a minimal copay would be something. More than half of these patients had diabetes and established coronary disease. More than 80% had high blood pressure and high cholesterol. Now, I have long said that more health care often does not lead to more health. And I cite the insurance studies. RAND the Oregon Health Insurance Experiment, and the Karnataka India Experiment, which all found that giving more preventive care did not significantly improve outcomes. And you have the recent JAMA paper showing that states that expanded Medicaid did not lead to better cardiovascular care. Then there was the MI-free trial in the New England Journal of Medicine. Free meds after MI, no difference in outcome. And you have Artemis trial in JAMA. Vouchers for clopidogrel, led to no difference in one-year MACE after PCI. Access was free, high-value meds in low-income patients, a group most likely to benefit, and again, no difference. Well, why? Why is this? Well, here's my idea. There's too much soft thinking in cardiology. In journals and meetings and Twitter, all full up of association studies showing that patients who adhere to more guideline-directed medical therapy do better. Low-income people do worse because they don't adhere to medicines as well, goes the thinking. The problem is that prevention is far more complex than simply adhering to guidelines. Why have so few people thought to say 
that the mere ability to adhere to four heart failure medicines may be a marker for a healthier patient, and it is those factors that lead to better outcomes. Has it ever dawned on people to look at how small the absolute risk reductions actually are in some of these anointed therapies? Even statins, look, I'm a statin proponent, but even statins, you're looking at a 1% to 2% absolute risk reduction in mostly non-fatal outcomes. That's fine, but people are complex. If you had a group that 100% took statins and 0% that did not, you could show differences. But in a real world where people have stressful lives, they're taking care of children, grandchildren, sick elders, difficult marriages, or difficult jobs, the idea of taking a medicine for a 1% to 2% absolute risk reduction of a non-fatal event over the next decade probably doesn't rate very high in their priority. And here, I always think of Victor Montori from the Mayo Clinic. He rings in my ear. Victor Montori has called for doctors to understand the work of being a patient and focus on delivering minimally disruptive care. Pick the highest value thing a patient can do. Focus on that. I mean, for instance, dinking around with a systolic blood pressure of 145 might pale in comparison to helping a patient eat less salty snacks or helping her carve out 15 minutes per day for a walk. Finally, and I'm sorry if this is disruptive, but I have to say it, so much of health is out of our, the clinician's hands. And I know that may sound weird, but our preventive pills pale in comparison to luck. The luck to avoid stochastic events. The luck to live in a supportive family. The luck to live in a nice community, one with sidewalks and parks, or the luck to have a meaningful job. My point here is not nihilism. We can do a lot of good for people with preventive care, not just with pills, but education about exercise and diet and listening and empathy. But we should also avoid the soft thinking that preventive tablets are the main factors on the causal pathway to good health. In retrospect, I really think that access may have been one of the best studies from ACC, so I say proficiat David Campbell et al. Okay, final topic, really short. Metabolically healthy obese. JAMA Network Open has published a survey of NHANES data from 1999 to 2018 looking at the prevalence of metabolically healthy obese patients. MHO, metabolically healthy obese, is defined as a BMI greater than 30, but no metabolic disorders such as blood pressure, glucose, or lipid issues. Well, this cross-sectional study suggests that the age standardized proportion of metabolically healthy obese has increased among U.S. adults from 1999 to 2018. The numbers were like 10.6% uh, in the early phases versus 15% in the years 2015 to 2018, and I suspect it's probably higher even now in 2023. Here's my problem with this. I don't think the words healthy and obese belong in the same category. The mean age of these patients were only in their mid-40s. And what do you think will happen to these patients in their mid-50s or mid-60s? This is what I tell patients who are overweight or who have obesity. I say, you may be skirting issues now, but to preserve quality of life in the future, not just cardiac health, but bone and joint health, mobility, we should work on weight loss strategies now. I think we do a great disservice to patients who have high BMIs by declaring them metabolically healthy. I don't like it. I always start these discussions by saying that I am not a preacher, and I do worship at the altar of liberty. I believe in freedom, and I recoil against all forms of coercion. But as a health advisor, I would encourage patients to consider weight loss strategies, because regardless of good laboratory studies, having a BMI above 30 puts you at risk for future problems. Okay. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. And remember, friends, if you like this podcast, please take the time to give us a rating. Write us a one or two sentence review. These things go a long way to help others finding us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. 
You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.